Life is full of important questions. Are we alone in the universe? What is the purpose and meaning of time? Is there life on Mars? And why do the Beatles' Capital album sound so... I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions, and we all know that the Beatles' US Capitol albums have a distinctive sound all of their own, which has always been the subject of passionate debate. In this video, I'm going to take a close look at those early Capitol albums and find out the reasons why they sound like they do. Now, it won't surprise you to know that I grew up with the UK albums, so it's those which are burned into my brain as being the ones. The man responsible for the sound of the Beatles records in America was head of A&R at Capitol, Dave Dexter Jr. He had begun his career as a jazz journalist in Kansas in the late 1930s and had joined Capitol a year after its formation in 1943. By 1957, he was at the top of his game, having been responsible for bringing some of the biggest names to the label, like Frank Sinatra, Nat King Cole, Peggy Lee, Duke Ellington, and many more. EMI had bought Capital in 1955 as a reaction to the loss of its licensing deal with Columbia Records in 1952 and the looming loss of a similar agreement with RCA in 1957. Like many of his generation, Dexter didn't like pop music, least of all rock and roll. In 1957, at the age of 42, he wrote a despairing memo to EMI's managing director, L.G. Wood, who was of a similar age. We are in a most discouraging revolution in the pop singles field. A great majority of singles are bought not by college students, but by mere children. Youngsters as young as 11, 12 and 13 years old. They buy strictly for The Beat. And as you can tell by the Elvis Presley and Guy Mitchell hits over there, the lyrics are juvenile and maddeningly repetitious. By 1963, the rock and roll storm appeared to be over. Elvis was busy with films, and no one had come forward to claim his crown. But unbeknownst to Dexter, a new sound was emerging in the UK, spearheaded, of course, by the Beatles. Also at this time, EMI had become frustrated by the lack of success that their artists were having on Capitol. Even Cliff Richard's massively successful number one single, Living Doll, sold just 566 copies in the US in 1959. The main problem was basically one of promotion. Outside of pressing up promotional discs for radio stations, Capital did nothing to promote UK artists. American audiences, EMI were told, just weren't interested in the British sound. And to a large extent, he was right. The birthplace of rock and roll had more than its fair share of talent, and British music between 1959 and 1962 was fairly tame. Even when presented with the chance to take the Beatles in the summer of 1963, Dexter decided not to and took Frank Ifield instead, leaving the Beatles to flounder on Swan Records. Despite having already sealed a film soundtrack rights deal with United Artists, L.G. Wood finally persuaded Capitol to take on the Beatles in late 1963. So Dexter had no choice, now he had to work with the Beatles. After the huge success of I Want to Hold Your Hand, it was Dexter's job to get an album out as soon as possible. Whilst not liking their music, Dexter knew his job, and more importantly, the American market. And the result, of course, was this, Meet the Beatles. Originally planned for mid-February 1964, the album was brought forward to January the 20th, and by March was selling half a million copies a week. Putting this and with the Beatles side by side, I think Meet the Beatles is a more entertaining album. Unfortunately, I Want to Hold Your Hand couldn't go on the With the Beatles album for the simple reason that it wasn't recorded until one week after the album was released. In fact, the Beatles themselves have been widely quoted as saying they thought the practice of putting singles on albums was a rip-off and they didn't want to do it on their albums. But that wasn't exactly true. Love Me Do, Please Please Me, A Hard Day's Night, Can't Buy Me Love, Ticket to Ride, Help, Eleanor Rigby, Get Back, Something and Let It Be were all singles lifted from UK albums. 
not to mention some of the B-sides. Capital were just more upfront about it, and it made good business and marketing sense, as did putting 12 tracks on it, as opposed to 14 on the UK album. This was because in the US, song publishers are paid a mechanical license for every song on an album, whereas in England, publishers receive a share of the total royalties paid on each album sold. So financially, it didn't really matter how many tracks were on a UK album, but it restricted the amount of tracks US record companies were prepared to use. That aside, the album which emerged is a masterpiece, and whilst it's difficult to fault the track listing and artwork, its sound quality is another issue. Sound quality, and especially stereo, was something which Capital had always prided itself on. After all, they had some of the best recording studios in the country, which produced some fabulous recordings. But as with everything of this nature, the end product is only going to be as good as what you put in, and that was where the problems began. As we saw earlier in his memo to LG Wood, Dexter realised pretty early on that the market for these records was basically kids. And what did kids listen to their records on? Well, something like this. So clearly sound quality was never going to be at the top of Dexter's list when putting together a Beatles album. In one of our previous videos about the Beatles' Australian releases, we saw that the first two albums released there were pressed for Mothers or Stampers, made by EMI in London. This resulted in the Australian albums sounding almost exactly like the UK pressings. However, Capital wanted the tapes because they had their own ideas and strategies. The tapes sent from EMI in London to Capital in LA were copies of the Twin Track Stereo Masters. True Mono Masters were available. In fact, VJs introducing the Beatles had used them. But Capital wanted the stereo tapes and would create their own mono mix downs known as Mono Type B, i.e. fold downs of the stereo mix. These days, it's easy to get perfect copies of any audio material, thanks to digital copying, which is virtually lossless. But back in the 1960s and the days of analog tape, generational loss from copying was one of the biggest issues for record producers and companies. Simply put, the more times an analog tape is copied, the lower the quality gets. The high and low end degrade and tape noise increases. By the time the tapes reached the Capitol Tower from EMI, they were already one generation down from the master. Each song on that newly arrived tape was assigned a separate master number and stored on a 10 inch reel, holding 10 songs each. If one of the songs on the reel was needed for inclusion on an album, it was removed from that reel and spliced together with other tracks to form the album's master tape. Each album had two tapes, one for side one and one for side two, which were each given the number you see in the dead wax, also known as the matrix number. Protection copies of those masters were then made and then sent to New York for East Coast mastering. The earlier one was used in LA, leading to claims that West Coast copies sound better than East Coast copies because they're one generation up. Now those tapes were ready for mastering. It was at this stage that the mastering engineer could add compression, reverb, EQ settings and volume, etc. It was then cut to disc and the lacquers sent to the factory. The factories then made the metalwork for pressing, which is where another issue occurred. Unlike at EMI, where this process was centralised under one roof at Hayes, the metal parts for Capitol Beatles records were made in three separate factories, in Scranton, Pennsylvania, Los Angeles and Jacksonville, Illinois, which of course created inconsistencies in quality. To muddy the waters and quality even further, Capitol, in an effort to meet demand, subcontracted Columbia, Decca and RCA to press albums for them. Furthermore, the quality of the vinyl was of a different formulation than used by EMI, and in my experience, it's noisier than UK vinyl. Unfortunately, I can't play you any examples of how they sound, but I'll try and illustrate it using this RX software. Take a look at this graph, which on top shows the waveform of a UK first pressing 45 of I Want to Hold Your Hand, and a recording of that same track taken from a US first mono pressing of Meet the Beatles. Both pressings have lots of healthy looking peaks in the waveforms, but the real story comes when I switch to the spectrogram. This shows a range of frequencies, lowest at the bottom of the display and highest at the top, and shows how loud events are at different frequencies. On the UK 45 above, 
Although there's a weakening of the high end at around 15K, there's still good strength of signal above it. On the same track recorded from Meet the Beatles, the high end signal comes to an end at 13K, with virtually nothing above it. That absence of high end is purely from generational loss from tape copying. Now it's true to say that the first UK pressing of With the Beatles is no sonic masterpiece, far from it in fact. It's harsh and brittle sounding with that characteristic upper mid-range boost most UK records had at the time, not to mention a complete lack of bass. The UK stereo is even worse, it's clumsily mixed and very woolly sounding overall. Although Dexter had played a pretty straight bat with the sound on Meet the Beatles, it was a different story when it came to the next album. When he heard the tapes EMI had sent over to use for the second album, he thought that there was something wrong with them. They were too loud, there was no bass, loads of bad edits, etc. And in some cases, you have to say he had a point. EMI's goal, at least as far as pop music was concerned, was basically to make everything sound as loud as possible, without the stylus jumping out of the groove. Dexter and Capital wanted to make everything sound as exciting as possible and irresistible on TV or AM radio, so the emphasis was on the mix rather than the volume. And it's no accident that the Capital albums are cut significantly quieter than the UK ones. The first thing Dexter did with the EMI tapes was to run them through Capital's number 9 echo chamber. Then he employed the Fairchild limiter, the same legendary piece of studio equipment which had also been used during the recording of the songs at Abbey Road. The results certainly gave the songs more body and changed their overall tone completely and proved very effective on the stereo tapes. But these waveforms of the track Rollover Beethoven clearly show the difference between the two. This is from the UK stereo pressing. There's lots of transient dynamic peaks in the waveform with well-defined spaces between them. Compare that and you can see a much more compressed waveform where the quieter sections are pumped up, making it sound fuller and more energetic overall. And it's those basic ingredients which gave you the capital sound. But for some tracks, they only had a mono tape to work with and producing a stereo master from those was one of their biggest challenges. To do this, Capital Engineers created what they called duophonic stereo mixes, where the engineers adjusted the high and low ends, adding a fair dose of reverb for good measure. This, of course, was never going to work out well. For example, Capital found the sound of the UK mono mixes of I Feel Fine, She's a Woman single way too dry. To compensate, they made it sound huge by plastering it with reverb. It's tough for British ears to take, but you might prefer it that way. And after all, it didn't stop it becoming a massive hit. But when it was time to make a stereo version for the Beatles 65 album, the resulting duophonic mix is probably the worst sounding track in the entire Beatles US catalog. It's not all bad news though. Some of these mixes are a lot of fun and in some cases bring much needed life to some of the UK mixes. These records were made for Beatles fans who cared about the music, not about the sound quality and suggestions that Dexter deliberately tried to destroy their sound are ridiculous. He may have been too old school for their music, but he was a good guy and did what he thought was best for the Beatles music. Would the Beatles records have been successful if the records hadn't been capitalized? We'll never know. But those capital albums are part of history and are loved and cherished by those who grew up with them. If you don't own them on vinyl and want to experience them in their best light, I'd recommend this 2004 box set, The Beatles on Capital Volume 1. Don't be put off by the horrible packaging. The CDs are very well mastered and sound way better than on the original vinyl. It's a lot of fun and very cheap to pick up. I still play my UK first pressings all the time, but I'd be interested to know from those of you who've grown up with the Capital albums what your go-to pressings are now. Let me know in the comments and also how you feel about the sound quality of these albums. But it's time to stick a fork in this one because it's done. So I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.